to talk about both the past and what we can learn from it, but also to evaluate some of our global challenges that are occurring at the local scale. So I'm really pleased tonight to introduce your moderator, Professor Gene Kelly. Gene is a professor of pedology. He's the uh, deputy director for the, Agri the Col Colorado State Agricultural Experiment Station. I knew I blew that. But anyway, welcome, Gene, and correct me. Yeah, no, thanks, Diana. Thanks for the introduction. It's great to be here again, and, and we're all looking forward to you know, having our events back at uh, uh, Avogadro's face-to-face. Uh, -face. So uh, this is our second one, Managing the Planet of the Semester, and I'm happy that everybody was here to join us. We'll have a great, hopefully a great conversation tonight. As Diana said, we talk about everything sustainable. Um, just uh, for your calendars and for your information, we have some upcoming events coming up on March 26th. We have a sustainability happy hour with guest Audie Chestnut, uh, CS, uh, the SOGES visiting fellow. On the 27th, the Antarctic Public Lecture uh, virtual through the Fort Collins Library, and that'll be there um, as well. And if you want more information about programs at the School of Global Environmental Sustainability, just go to sustainability um, that, uh, at Colorado State University, and you can look on the website and sign up on our mail list and, and get all that good information about what's going on. Um, so anyway, so what I was going to do is um, just provide a, a brief overview of the way this is going to work virtually. What I'll do is I'll, I'll provide a little bit of an, uh, an overview. Um, I'll introduce each of the panelists with a short bio and then we'll start off with uh, one question for each of the panelists and let them provide some context in terms of their interest and um, experience in, in, in our topic tonight. And then we'll open it up for uh, questions and virtual discussions. And uh, we ask that you do those in the Q&A part of the, of the website. So you can go down here and type those in and then we'll, you know, we'll read those to the, uh, to the, the panelists and then uh, we'll try to wrap things up by around um, 6.15. So it, it's great to be here again. And, and tonight we have a, you know, kind of a really exciting, I think, topic, um, planning for climate change and, and talking about lessons uh, from the Dust Bowl. And it's, it's something we all talk about and we hear about a lot particularly with all the droughts that we're having in the Western US. So there, there are some really interesting aspects of this and we're gonna to talk to our experts about uh, their, um, their knowledge of the Dust Bowl and what we can sort of look, look ahead to uh, based on the projections of climate change. So what I'm gonna do is I'm introduce our panelists um, and then I'll provide each of them with a, with a kind of an introductory question. Our first panelist is Dr. Becky Bollinger. Uh, she's a climate, uh, climatologist uh, and drought specialist and serves as the assistant state climatologist at the Colorado Climate Center. Um, welcome, Becky. Uh, that's in the, the, the Department of Atmospheric Sciences. She re received her BS in meteorology from Metro State in Denver and MS in meteorology from Florida State. And her PhD was in atmospheric sciences right here at Colorado State University. And I think, Becky, you worked on the, um, the upper Colorado River Basin, right? You did some climate and hydroclimatology there. So um, a lot of experience in Colorado um, um, uh, climate. Um, also, uh, her research is focused on Colorado's climate variability, extremes, and drought, and she likes spending her spare time outside hiking and cycling and running. So, Becky, welcome to our panel, and uh, look forward to discussing with you. Next is uh, you. My, coll my colleague, Alan Knapp. Uh, Alan's a professor in the Department of Biology. He's also the senior ecologist for the graduate degree program in ecology, and he is also a university distinguished professor. He received his BS from Idaho State University, his master's and PhD from the University of Wyoming. And if you ever go to a CSU Wyoming game, you'll notice Alan is sitting on the wrong side of the field. Uh, Dr. Knapp uh, came to CSU from Kansas State University. We had a very long and distinguished career in ecology. He came as the senior ecologist for the GDPE program. That's how we stole him away. Prior to that, uh, Alan has been working in, and throughout his career in grassland ecology, both in the United States and internationally. Uh, his current research uh, really sort of focuses on plant physiologic. He's a plant physiological ecologist. So everything climate change, everything water, everything stomates. Um, he's been working for nearly three decades on that and very large scale projects associated with the long-term ecological research program. Um, and again, he worked a lot at the Kansa Prairie. Alan's also a fellow of the Ecological Society of America and the American Geophysical Union. So Alan, welcome to, I think this might be your first panel, but I'm not sure. So I'm gonna have to, it's only been 10 years, but I think this is the first time we were able to nab Alan. Um, next, Dr. Susan Melzer is an assistant professor in the Department of Soil and Crop Sciences and the School of Global Environmental Sustainability. She received her master's degree in geological sciences at the University of Colorado and a doctorate in soil science from um, Colorado State University. 
Her background is in geology and sedimentary geology, and that's really sort of sparked her interest in quantifying weathering rates in soils, looking at the impact of climate change and land use on uh, soil formation, soil quality, and, and soil system resilience. Uh, Sue Ellen also works very closely in collaboration with the USDA, NRCS, and the Cooperative Soil Survey. She works with the National Park Service, and she's developed accessible data and education materials from soils data, which enables uh, the link between educators, researchers, and park managers. She recently received the Provost Faculty Excellent Faculty Scott, this ex Provost Faculty Excellence and Faculty Teaching Scholar Award. So, uh, welcome Sue Ellen to your first panel with us. Um, and then finally. Um, Dr. Doug Shefflin is an associate teaching professor in the Department of History, and he teaches courses in the University Honors Program. He received his PhD at the University of Colorado uh, in Modern American History with emphasis on environmental history. He teaches a variety of courses related to American history, um, and, but especially teaching American environmental history and the history of the U.S. foreign relations over the last few semesters. His first book entitled The Legacies of Dust. Land Use and Labor of the Great Colorado Plains, excuse me, was published by University of Nebraska Press, came out in 2019. Um, it combines environmental labor, immigration history, uh, a really novel perspective on the Dust Bowl and its impact on Colorado and, and its citizens. He refers to it uh, as the lessons that were learned in the 30s helped us in the filthy 50s, and we'll see what's going to happen moving ahead. I'm interested to hear what he has to say. Um, the book was the 2019 Choice Academic uh, Title and finalist for the 2020 Center of uh, Study of American West Outstanding Book Award. So welcome, Doug, to our panel. We look forward to discussing um, this with you. So anyway, so I think I'll start off, Becky, I'll, go, I'll circle back and, and let me start off with you, just a, a brief sort of overview from the, from the perspective of, of, of a climatologist and a climatological perspective. What, what, with the Dust Bowl, how, how dry was it and, and, you know, and, and why did it happen? Why were we dealing with that? Is there, just provide us with a little overview. Yeah, I think, uh, th first of all, thank you for having me on the panel. And uh, I look forward to the discussion. It was, why did it happen is a pretty complicated question um, because it really is just kind of part of our climate, especially in this region as we transition from um, the lower plains in the Midwest uh, that, that have a lot of moisture, that are really moisture rich, to an area that is a little bit more arid, high elevation, um, and can be more volatile. We have a lot of variability. And so it, uh, it is a normal occurrence that we can expect to have um, extended dry periods that, that become droughts. Um, the 1930s was an interesting case um, because <clears throat> we had several years in a row with below average precipitation. And then the highlight of that was in 1934 when it was much below average. Um, and so when you're, you're adding up those deficits slowly over the years, and then you have a year that's, that's extremely dry, it's, it's going to have a compounding effect um, and it's going to be really hard uh, to, to dig out of that deficit. Then the second part of um, drought and any severe drought is, is adding on that temperature component. And what we saw in the 1930s was really unheard of at that time that you would have temperatures that warm um, for a lot of areas of our state on the eastern plains and and in the southern plains as you go into to Kansas and Oklahoma and the Texas panhandle um, the temperatures have not been that warm um, in the summer uh, or or annual temperatures ever since then um, and and really um, it, it's, it's more representative of temperatures that we might see today in the context of climate change, um, which wasn't really something that, that was talked about or actually experienced then. Um, so, so the temperatures were so extreme and then add that to multiple years of, of dry conditions um, really, really led to that, um, to that period of, of the Dust Bowl. Great. No, thank you. Okay, well, we'll stay in order. Um, let me move over to Alan. Alan, uh, I guess uh, the, it would be interesting to, to get your perspective from, you know, sort of like, you know, that was centered in the, the, you know, the western portions of the Great Plains and much of the Great Plains. That's maybe your perspective from an ecological grassland perspective, you know, well, what, what happened to the native systems and, and, and why and, 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 um, and maybe provide some perspective there. 
Sure. So um, following up on Becky, um, as, as a grassland ecologist, one thing um, that we all know is, is that droughts are really common in regions where grasslands are. So uh, studying drought, understanding drought effects in, in native systems and grasslands is something that all grasslands ecologists do and, and what we care about. But the Dust Bowl is this right, really extreme example. And, and also, as Becky said, it's sort of a, a, a way to think about how the future might be, because, um, you know, we had this decadal period of very high temperatures and very low moisture in this region. And many climate models, at least many climatologists, uh, think that that would be more common in the future, not less common. So we're likely to live through these kind of conditions again. Um, fortunately, from an ecological perspective, um, we have good records of what happened during the 1930s. There were ecologists around then. Uh, they made lots of measurements. They took lots of photos. Uh, so we have a really solid record of the changes in natural ecosystems that occurred as a result of that 10-year extreme drought period. And what's always fascinated me is, is that those changes uh, were pretty much unexpected based upon what we normally understand about grasslands. Um, in, in a nutshell, what happened is, is that when we think about grasslands in the Great Plains, we can normally categorize the species, the plants that grow there into those that prefer the cooler, wetter times of the year in the spring and those that do really well in the hot, hotter, drier summers. And so you might expect with 10 years of drought, those that do well under the hot, dry conditions normally would do even better uh, under those, that decadal drought period. And it turns out exactly the opposite happened. Um, those species that were normally adapted to hot and dry conditions literally disappeared in many cases mm -hmm. from many parts of the, of the Great Plains. And it was the cool season species, the species that normally grow in the spring that actually flourished. And of course, this, this, was, this was essentially a paradox for many folks at trying to understand why this system would respond so differently to an extreme drought than it would to more typical drought conditions. And it turns out the answer is, is relatively simple. It, it was just so hot, as Becky mentioned, and dry during the times of year when the normal summertime grasses would grow, that they could not grow at all. They couldn't even survive that period. And the only thing, the only plants that were left to grow were those that could sort of hang on in the spring. They could, they could use some of the carryover winter precipitation from snow. It was still, they were still cool springs even during that decade of really hot, dry conditions. And so they actually flourished under, under dust bowl conditions. And what this tells us as ecologists is, is that there's a lot of surprises out there when we think about a future of climate change, we think about trying to understand and predict how grasslands are gonna respond in the future. There's a lot of things that we just don't know yet. Um, but the Dust Bowl does provide a great example of just how important and how different these extreme events can be for understanding the ecology of these systems. Thanks, Alan, I appreciate that. Okay, so Alan, um, I'll move over to you. So maybe just a, a soils perspective, maybe uh, from the, the sort of the origin of the dust and, and the, where it all ended up and also the, the agricultural soils perspective. Um, sure. Yeah. Yeah, um, I think that one of the biggest lessons that was learned from the Dust Bowl specifically was that, uh, that we really failed to, to understand the system, right? In this case, the, the ecological system and, and how then to manage it based on what was there. So about two and a half million years ago, glaciers formed and the glaciers came from the north and they really scoured the rock and it dumped everything that it was scouring out further south, right? So present day Iowa, Ohio, Missouri, and that caused this this temperature differential really caused these high winds to form and these fertile pulverized dust storms, this lust, as we call it, to, to, to basically farther, even farther down, shape Kansas, Nebraska, Dakota, the Dakotas, um, et cetera. And so this then became the, this really silty soil became the, the, the substrate um, for, for, for the soil, for the grasses to grow from. And so, um, this is really, you know, highly fertile soil um, that has good nutrients that the grasses can turn over, the organic matter in the soil. Um, and part of that moisture that's kept in the soil, when you start to manage it, dissipates, right? It evaporates and the soil structure then is no longer being able to help be held in the soil. And additionally, when you disaggregate the soil through management practices, you're also oxidizing the organic matter and you're losing soil moisture. 
And silt, because of the origin of this pair material being silt, it really doesn't have any cohesive properties to have the weight to sort of stay behind. Um, and it's not large enough of a particle size to stay behind. And so it's very easily picked up by dust and transported away. So, you know, in the case of the dust bowl, um, we can use that as such a good analog for today. And it's something that we didn't, again, we failed to understand the ecosystem because you know, as, as early farmers or homesteaders of the Great Plains came from the east, they didn't realize while the, you know, the curves between temperature and precipitation were the same, the precipitation in the Great Plains was a lot less. It was a lot lower, 50 millimeters per month lower, right, instead of the 100 millimeters per month that you were getting in the east, which is what the typical farming practices we're farming in. Um, and in addition to that, you have the evaporation that consistently exceeds the precipitation that you get in the east. And so there are limits on what the soil can take um, in the Great Plains that you don't have um, in the east where these um, homesteaders originated from. So the soils of the Great Plains, they're made up of windblown parent material. Right, they're they're high in silk content. They're low in organic matter. We're talking, you know, uh, tops 2.5 percent organic matter. They have really weak aggregation, and because of that, they're really susceptible to wind and water erosion. And what's keeping them in place is the above ground biomass. It's the grassland vegetation. You remove that, and that soil now becomes exposed, and you're blowing all that material around. Oh, great, thanks, Joan. That was great. Uh, finally, Doug, uh, maybe a socio-political perspective. I mean, you know, uh, in terms of the historical perspective of Dust Bowl, how how did people deal with this, and and what what were the big political changes, or what really happened as a result of this? Yeah. Um, first off, thanks for having me. Yeah. Um, one thing I would mention that's that's key to this, of course, is the human element. Um, and, and realistically, the Great Plow-Up is is what made a lot of this possible. Um, you know, the, the economics of Great Plains farming and the wheat boom that came out of World War I um, convinced a lot of people, compelled a lot of people to capitalize on wheat production. And that's obviously uh, in that environment and given the drought, a, a dangerous combination. One of the things that I've noticed in, in what I've looked at in Southeastern Colorado specifically um, is that the, the Dust Bowl itself had a dramatic political impact on the ways in which not only individuals thought about the state and their relationship to the state, but also how they identified. Um, most of the folks in, in rural southeastern Colorado, at least, had been uh, Republican, had been willing to kind of swear off federal or state intervention, had been very independent, very autonomous, very much wanting to keep that kind of independence. And then the drought coupled with the Great Depression convinced a lot of folks that maybe that wasn't going to work. Um, Franklin Roosevelt elected in 32 and 36, again in 40, uh, based on his idea of the New Deal, which could apply some federal assistance and support to farmers specifically. The uh, bevy of, of government programs that come out of the New Deal to try to alleviate some of the suffering and the misery that people were, were experiencing on the Southern Great Plains were successful in many respects. And they were at least enough to convince people to kind of reconceptualize the way that they thought about state assistance, um, allowing in some cases at least outsiders to come into these rural communities that had been relatively isolated and, and seek the kind of assistance that they knew the state could only provide. Um, and so in a very basic way, even though it was temporary, the, the political shift is an important one because it allowed for the development of this kind of relationship that we'll see develop and, and then continue over the course of the 20th century. So the, the role that the politics play, the, the role that experts play from the Colorado Extension Service all the way up to the Soil Conservation Service and everywhere in between, uh, that's a, a really important piece of this changing dynamic between individuals and the state. Great, thank you. Um, okay, so we're, we're already starting to get questions. All right, so this will this will be good. Um, okay, the first question is, um, how much of the contributing reason to the, ducks, uh, to the Dust Bowl is the upheaval of grasslands and uh, to planting wheat crops. I think you sort of answered that, but somebody want to sort of address that a bit further. Doug, maybe you could handle that one, yeah. 
Yeah, sure, I'd be happy to. Um, the, one of the hardest things in, in terms of looking at the causes of course is, is appreciating that it's a crisis of epic proportions. Um, and as susceptible as, as this environment is to um, variability and exposure, it, it frankly, in my opinion, doesn't get to be as extreme as it does without humans messing with this environment. Um, and, and frankly, the market driven commodification of the soil, the ways in which suitcase farmers came in from outside, um, the appeal of the wheat boom that came along with World War I and continued in the 1920s, it was enough to convince people to pile everything they had up. Um, and while we tend to focus on, on big landowners, anybody who could have access to these locations, to this environment who could plant wheat was gonna do it. Um, and in my opinion, at least that fever uh, certainly exposed and made even more vulnerable an ecosystem that frankly couldn't handle it. Um, and, and so in that case, I don't think you get the Dust Bowl without kind of that kind of intensive agriculture that we see come out of the late 19 teens and into the 1920s. Right. Um, uh, I'm Becky, I, I have a question um, for Becky. Is, was there any, I know this, was there any sense that there were people forecasting climate back then? I mean, was this, did they know this was coming or was this just a complete, were we just responding to mother nature? Was there any sense that we were heading toward a catastrophe? Um, you know, it, I'm sure that, that there was a uh, lack of knowledge of, of this type of event. Um, a lot of information that was provided in terms of climate wasn't as long term as we have now in terms of records. And you're talking about people moving into brand new locations that they didn't even fully understand. So um, Sue Ellen mentioned that it's like you're moving to a place and you're thinking it's like um, the, the wetter Midwest or the East where you were originally from and, and it's not. So how can you prepare for something in um, a place where you don't even understand the climate um, or the climatology? And we have records now that, um, you know, go back to the late 1800s and, and that's over 120 years of record for us. Um, but back then, um, they, those those were uh, 1895 wasn't as far away as it is now, and it, it didn't really give a clear indication of, of what the climate was doing. So uh, many decisions being made at that time were made without a, a, a good understanding of, of the climate. Um, and so I imagine that um, they, they did not um, have any preparation for this coming. There was no such word as, as preparedness or mitigation. Um, you know, you just, you farm the land and, and you expect that what you had the first year is, is probably what you're gonna have the next year and the year after that. And, and that, was, that was the way you did it. And so uh, I think that's, that's one of the big advantages we have now is, is that we have a clear understanding of, of what's to come. And we know that we will have events like this and that we have to prepare for them. Um, and in terms of, you know, a drought monitor, they, they knew they were in a drought, but um, to the extent or how severe or how long it was or how long it may go, they didn't have that information. They didn't have a U.S. drought monitor. Um, I'm not sure exactly when the USDA started their weekly uh, crop bulletins. I think it might have been in the 50s. So yeah, they, they didn't really have the information that, that we get to uh, use today. Great. Uh, next question is... Oh, can uh, I add on to that, Gene? Oh, yeah, go for it, Suan. I'm sorry. Yeah, you I guys just, jump in. Yeah. yeah, no, I just wanted to follow up on what, what Doug was saying, too, um, in reference to what we knew and what we didn't know. You know, thankfully, the Soil Conservation Services in the Department of Agriculture was established um, during this time to develop the extensive conservation programs that we have today, right? That stemmed from the knowledge that we gained from this experience. So it's not that we had a lot of this knowledge to start with, but it was something that we went through and programs like, again, the, the Soil Conservation Services were put then in place in these programs to retain topsoil and to prevent the irreparable damage to the land. Um, farming techniques like strip cropping or terracing, crop rotation, cover cropping were all beginning to be advocated um, after the fact. And so today we can 
appreciate the practices in soil conservation, but in fact, this was a really important outcome and a lesson that we learned um, from this time. And even so, right, the Dust Bowl of the 1930s, once that ended and we had a wet cycle um, through the 40s or, you know, into the 50s when that wet cycle ended, we had another two-year drought and we've seen droughts periodically throughout um, decades after um, the 1930s. And so we continue to um, have these droughts and even though we may perceive the problem, we may perceive that we have drought and maybe there was, you know, some perception that, that it was more arid and that we'd have problems with dust storms. Um, it's this failure to act on what we're perceiving, right, as a problem. And, um, and the example of that is how we then start to mitigate. So after that wet period ended in the 1950s, guess what? People returned to the land and they continued the practices again. Thankfully, now having the soil conservation services in place with some other options for those that bought into the idea. Um, but, you know, there's no reason to think that it can't happen again, right? The Sahara Desert was once a savanna a few thousand years ago, and there's no reason to think, well, that North America can't also change into that. So I just wanted to the point out that through mitigation, like now, you know, after that, we started to rely on groundwater sources. So the Ogallala Aquifer started becoming tapped into in order to stabilize the, that system to keep the, the dust bowls from happening, right? To keep the soil wet. And that's just now introducing another problem. Are we gonna perceive this problem of the Ogallala Aquifer becoming depleted or are we gonna follow into the same cycle that we did in the 1930s? Sorry, I just went off on. No, that's great. <laughs> um, Gene, can I add something yeah, as well? Yeah, sure, absolutely. Yeah. So um, I think I think the other thing that's important to, in thinking about this question about agriculture and the drought it is to separate. We, we call it the dust bowl drought, but there's the dust and then there's the drought, right? And and those are there's two different things driving those, right? We we can we, we could have, for example, historically based on tree ring records and pack rad middens, there were much more severe droughts hundreds of years ago, at least our best estimates, that probably didn't result in, and didn't have the dust along with them. And, and so we can mitigate the dust, right? We the Soil Conservation Service and better agricultural practice can deal with that, but that won't change the fact that drought itself, right, is likely to recur and, and likely to recur at this very long time scale in the future. And I think that's what, you know, that's what we have to keep in mind that, that when we worry about, we talk about the interaction between agriculture and drought, there's a strong interaction in agriculture and dust that was, that was, that occurred during the drought, but the drought itself is far more climatological than right. it is based upon agriculture. Yeah. Alan, I have a follow-up. So, so were there any, was there any record or any sort of historical record of, I mean, we, we typically talk about when we speak of the Dust Bowl in this period of this, this uh, you know, horrible drought. And you know, obviously there seems to be, you know, we're getting to the discussion about improper use of the land and, and all that. What about from the standpoint of livestock and grazing? Was there an impact on that? I mean, was there any, I mean, I didn't, you never read about that. You see mostly about, you know, the people out with the plowed fields, but what about the livestock industry or the grasslands themselves in the thirties? Was there, you know, you said there was a shift in vegetation. Was, was there a grazing overprint on that, that, that pushed it one way or the other? Do you know? Yeah, so um, I, I'm not an expert on what happened with the grazing management during that time, except read, reading what the ecologist wrote. So John Weaver was an ecologist at Nebraska right. at the time, and, and he studied a lot of grazed and ungrazed grasslands. And, and, and when you read what he talked about, he basically mentioned that, uh, or described most of the grasslands not having cattle anymore after a while, because of course they just couldn't raise the cattle. There was no forage right. for them. And so there, there likely was an interaction early on until the forage was gone. And then after that, I don't think I don't think he can have much of a grazing interaction when there's nothing for the cattle to eat. Right, right. But then yeah. it was also the, the idea of supplementing, right? And that's even worse for the system, right? You know, right. in terms of yeah. doing that, right? Yeah. Uh, great. Uh, any other follow-ups on that? We can go to another question. Um, here's a question. There's a lot of them, so I'm just going to pick them. And then, uh, are there precedents elsewhere in the world for the U.S. Dust Bowl? And if so, what are the primary similarities and differences? Anybody can jump in, don't be shy. 
Dean, we're not seeing the questions. I don't know if you can repeat, repeat the yeah, question. I'm sorry. Yeah. Are there precedents and elsewhere in the world for the U.S. Dust Bowl? And if so, what are the primary similarities and differences? So are there other parts of the planet that have had experiences like this? And are there similarities and differences as a result of that? I don't, um, I'm not entirely sure of, of exactly the similarities or differences, but there are dust bowls that happen all around the world. Um, we have grassland ecosystems in, um, in uh, every con on every continent almost. And, um, and so, yeah, we have the climate that is arid in, in each of these and the grasslands, whether that ties in with the agricultural piece of it, like Alan was saying, the dust being um, spurred by the, the agricultural piece, um, I think was, was experienced in Europe as well, but I can't speak to some of the other um, grassland systems with respect to agriculture and dust. Okay, great. Let's go on to the next question. Uh, interesting that the pre, um, oh, this one just moved, the previous droughts or dry periods in the late 1800s and early 1900s did not seem to create a predictive framework even then. Was there just a lack of science infrastructure at that time? So that's kind of back to that question I asked earlier, Becky, I think about were they really, was there, was forecasting even in the vernacular? <laughs> Did people even talk about forecasting um, climate? I mean, yeah, I'm sure there was uh, forecasting per se, but probably not to that mm -hmm. um, time scale or even uh, geographic scale. Mm -hmm. And um, I honestly, I, I'm not really sure that, that I know the answer to the question, um, uh, but I can also say that what had been seen before um, had, was not to the level of right. what happened. Mm -hmm. And so I think that even preparing for what had already happened, um, you wouldn't find yourself prepared for for that level of extreme. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, can I can I add to that? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, go ahead. This is anecdotal, um, but when you look at diaries and memoirs and journals from from the folks who moved here in the 1920s and 1930s, they'll often talk about old timers telling them the drought will come, except they don't actually listen. Um, so it's it's one thing about having the knowledge, and it's another thing applying that knowledge. Um, and, and for these individuals who basically believe that they could overcome any obstacle, drought or otherwise, mm -hmm. um, what some people have called maybe a stubbornness or, or maybe kind of a false confidence is, is really part of, part of that negotiation. And so to the extent that if the science was available, it, it would undoubtedly have an impact. I, I don't think we can say that. Mm -hmm. um, and again, I, I think part of Part of the danger here is, is looking at that human element and, and that's the part that I think we need to, to recognize right. is that even even though they knew and talked to people who had survived earlier droughts they were sure it wasn't going to happen to them and you couldn't convince them otherwise. Right um, that, yeah it's, that's a really important point. The, the, I think the, uh, the, the next question will be along the same lines. Um, how much did poor land management, uh, lack of crop rotations, monocultures, uh, and even loss of topsoil um, affect the loss of topsoil during the Dust Bowl. I think um, uh, clearly th th somebody want to pick that up, Sue Ellen, or, or the idea of the not, not having crop rotations, going to monocultures, those sorts yeah. of things. Yeah. Um, I mean, effectively what you're doing is by, by having monocultural systems and having a fallow period of time where you're leaving right. the soil bare is, is, was a big part of that problem, right? You're not stabilizing the soil, mm -hmm. you're not keeping in place. And so um, that is, that's exactly what happened. That's, that's yeah. the piece of that, of the agricultural system that um, was beyond the limit of what that, what the soil could take and what the system could take. So it's, yeah. it's definitely the, the practices that were put in place and today, we are with under conservation agriculture. We are, you know, promoting cover cropping to keep your soil covered year round, right? right. Or to at least extend the time to which the, that you can keep that soil covered. Yeah, um, and, and because with that, you're improving. Yeah, 
No, go ahead. Oh, go ahead. Oh, go ahead. With that, you're improving soil aggregation, you're decreasing um, the soil bulk density, you're improving the porosity of the soil and allowing that water to absorb the soil. Because during that time, what was actually also thought that when you leave your soil fallow, when you leave it bare, that it actually has more capacity to absorb. That was the previous thinking around that is that, oh, this is great. That water is going to go right into the soil and it's going to be soil storage. Well, in fact, when you leave it bare, you're going to have a more evaporation and you're going to have more loss from the physical loss of the soil as well. And so instead of having this storage pool for water, you're actually losing more water. And so that was a shift in thinking yeah. um, based on the management that took place. Yeah, I think it's a sort of, you know, the idea that you know, at that time, the, the real advancement was the, the concept of using two years of water to grow one year of crop, right? So if you have, you, you're, you have one fallow, you're, you're storing water. So that's, you know, in a lot of ways, you look at that, it's, oh, it's pretty bright. But then the reality was the risk, right, that was associated with that. When you didn't get the rain, your soils were vulnerable. Yeah. Uh, Becky, go ahead. Yeah. yeah I, and in, in addition, we... Go ahead. Sorry. I was just, I was just going to say that in addition to that, we now have the steam powered tractor, right? So now all of a sudden we can do five times as much work as we were able to do before. So, you know, the conversion from par from prairie to tilled land was very fast. It was very easy and we can plow millions of acres. Um, you know, in a 50 year period, we had converted a hundred million acres into tilled ground and so that'll have huge implications on the amount of organic matter that you can store um and and water and store water over that time period as well Becky. i didn't mean to cut you off becky no worries <laughs> so i wanted to add uh from a uh, meteorological perspective that um you know stripping the soils and and what swellen said is the allowed for more evaporation um i believe really set up this um feedback loop that um there's widely considered to have a, a feedback loop between the atmosphere and the soils um in the high plains region where um what are the soils releasing is it latent heat which is um, the evaporation with moisture, or is it sensible heat where there's no moisture, but it's still releasing heat um, into the atmosphere. And so when you have the moisture available, um, you're releasing latent heat, but when there's no more moisture anymore and you have these bare soils, you're releasing a lot of sensible heat and thus heating the atmosphere even more. Um, and then you're making the atmosphere even drier because you're not putting the water vapor into the atmosphere and you're putting the heat into the atmosphere. You're making it even less likely that you're going to have precipitation. And so uh, I do, um, you know, speculatively wonder or theorize that um, part of the extreme temperatures we've seen in some areas um, and, and the extreme dryness were, were partially driven by um, that poor land management that really um, contributed to exacerbate the situation. Okay, great. Okay. And, and, and yeah, let, me just, uh, let me just agree with that. Let me say, Becky, that's a great point. Um, and, and, and to add one more mechanism to that, the other is the uh, absorption or reflectance of solar radiation. So a, a grassland, a native system has vegetation on it, even if it's out of water, is a much lighter color, will reflect a lot of solar radiation away from the surface. A darkened soil, right? a dark soil laying in the open sun, not only if there's no water for latent heat, as, as Becky mentioned, it's also gonna absorb more of that sunlight. And, and there's another, that provides another mechanism for more sensible heat and these high temperatures that were experienced during that time of year. Right, great. Okay, another question, Doug, I think this is for you, because um, it says Doug. <laughs> Doug, regarding your last comment around the denial of drought, was the concept of rain follows the plow widely believed at that time? Yeah, that's a great question. and. I think in some ways the jury's still out because it's it's an easy kind of excuse uh, to suggest that the scientific community was fully backing this. Um, because I think for a lot of folks, the idea that rain follows the plow is justification for what they were doing. Um, and so rather than problematizing the idea that maybe this isn't good for us, it was certainly much more in line with this kind of market driven rationalization. There were enough people um, who at least flirted with this 
as you know, holding university appointments, faculty members uh, who wrote books, who published pamphlets, uh, but boosters are also gonna be part of this. And so we can question their motivations as well. Um, it's, again, I think it's an important piece here. Um, the motivation, the justification and the rationalization all kind of work together. And I don't see anything, at least the records that I've, I've been able to work on that suggests there's any real significant high level conversation among the people about rain follows the plow. It's just more of an assumption that this is a good thing for us to do and the opportunities outweigh any potential costs. Um, and, and so I think on some level, there's a disconnect between the folks on the ground and, and folks in, in kind of a more intellectual circle having these conversations. But for the most part, again, and I, I don't mean to denigrate this process because I, I think self-interest plays an important role here. Um, if they can see it as a justification for what they're doing, then, then they would probably buy into it. Great. Okay, another question from the audience. How are we preparing water resources and conservation practices for massive farming and preserving water in the soil? You can't keep taking water from Colorado and the aquifers for the plains for farming long term. So sort of more about water conservation and planning. Anybody want to address that? I think it's going to be a, and it is starting to become more of a mixed bag management style, right? Um, we continue to depend on our aquifers um, in much of the Great Plains. It is um, the Ogallala aquifer that we're using and that's allowing us to farm. One of the, one of the, the most impactful images that I have is when I fly out of DIA and I look down and I see crop circles, right? That, that show you this is not what the land is like naturally. You need water. It's all about the water. And um, we would not be able to grow what we grow here without the water. And so if the water doesn't come because it's drought, then we're gonna get it from a really secure water supply, right? Um, a water supply that has been accumulating for millions of years, but guess what? It's already over 50% overdrafted and, um, and that's what we're relying on. And so with that knowledge, we're now trying to promote um, these agricultural conservation practices, at least within the agricultural system, um, trying to do things like we were, we've been talking about cover cropping, crop rotations, um, figuring out ways in which we can best utilize our water most efficiently. So we're not wasting any water. Um, and so other practices in water conservation outside of agriculture, um, you know, most people have, have heard about, but the same questions come to mind when we're building reservoirs and how much evaporation is lost um, from reservoirs instead of, you know, storing water below ground. So it is sort of this balance between all the systems, but it's going to take conservation and active storage, right? Demand management and supply enhancement in order to secure water supply in order to, to feed the population and keep agriculture alive in, in the Great Plains region. I want to add to that, um, just that I think there um, in most states, um, there, there are so many activities that help promote um, water resources, conservation and soil conservation, and um, for farming and, and for ranching. Um, our, our own extension has, has put out resources um, on, on best management practices for ranching uh, in terms of, of how grazing can help uh, better protect uh, the land for long term. So I think that there are practices out there, um, but I also think it is important to, to point out that you're right, we, we can't keep taking the water um, from these aquifers um, without considering those long-term impacts that it's not an infinite reservoir and that they do need to be recharged. Yeah. And there are, um, 
I, there are places that are working to do that, um, not related to the Dust Bowl, but I do know in, in Arizona, um, they're, they're quite busy working on how they can actually recharge their groundwater supply um, that they have continually relied upon um, for, for many decades. So um, I think, I feel positive that we're moving in the right direction um, and that there are a lot of resources um, to help for this. Um, but I, I do think it is important to say that, that yeah, it, you know what, farming um, on these areas is uh, not necessarily what, what nature um, intended. And, um, you know, especially, especially some of the crops that require uh, well beyond the amount of water that the atmosphere provides um, in a given, you know, rolling 10 year period. But, um, but we are where we're at. And, you know, we also don't want to leave our, our uh, farmers high and dry, uh, pun intended. Um, but um, I think it's, it is definitely important to keep in mind, um, but also to remain positive because I think there is a lot of work that, that is going on to improve those practices. Becky, let me do, just have a quick follow-up. Um, so I know you worked in the upper Colorado and, and I know that that's a, there, there is a lot of, we're talking about lessons learned, right? And the upper Colorado, we know how it, it became sort of a, a, a hotspot, you know, over the last couple of years with this mega drought and everything and yeah. the water, never making it down to Mexico. In other words, that we're, we're, our utilization of water and our management of water is not appropriate. And what reminded me of was your, com your comment about Arizona because Arizona is having to rely more on groundwater now because the Colorado, and I'm just curious, like, I mean, in terms of, do, do we really have those, those buffers in place, right? When people, you know, that we're, we're mismanaging the Colorado and then we're having to draw more groundwater from Arizona, you know? I, I, you know, and you've studied that system before. I was just wondering if you knew had any feelings about that? Yeah. Oh, I have a lot of feelings about it. It's another <laughs> thing that, you know, came by, uh, came about in um, the 1920s with the Colorado River uh, Compact, mm -hmm. which uh, was based on a wet period in time that would not, was not really representative of the climate. And um, so that is uh, also another system that is, is heavily over allocated and, and very heavily managed um, to provide water to, to about you know, 50 million people that, that live in the West. Obviously we live in the West because you know, we, like, we like those nicer temperatures and, and more you know, manageable dew points and stuff, but, um, but that also means uh, getting us water, which um, has not been an easy task and is, is something that's going to be a major concern um, going forward in time, um, similar to farming. Um, and it's, it's important to point out that, that the majority of the water that is um, allocated to, uh, through the Upper Colorado River Basin is, is not going to people in their homes and their drinking water. Um, it, is, it is going to agriculture. So um, yeah, it is, that, that is uh, not as much connected to what happens in the plains, but definitely a concern and, and a lesson that we're still trying to learn um, going forward. Mm -hmm. Uh, here's a question. I think this was addressed before, but I'll, I'll go ahead and repeat the question. It says, was there a change in, in the albedo during the Dust Bowl and was it positive and did it cause more drought? I think that was uh, kind of the point that Alan was making yeah. as, you're, as you're switching uh, from the grasslands. Anytime you're, you're changing the land cover, you're going to be changing the albedo and uh, soils do have um, much more tendency to, to take in a lot more solar radiation mm -hmm. um, than, than the grasslands, as he had said. Okay, uh, another question. Um, how did the Native Americans manage grasslands? Are there any historical records of land management that we can learn from the original inhabitants, so indigenous sort of practices? Anybody aware of that? Um, I am not with regard to <laughs> drought. Um, so certainly there's lots of uh, evidence of, of active management of grasslands with fire, for example, by the, by the native peoples. Um, my, my reading is, is that when droughts hit, they essentially, that was a resource that the grasslands that were is gone to them, and they right. oftentimes just move. So they're yeah. they're they, they cope with that by leaving the area, not by trying right. to manage drought. 
Yeah, and there is some archaeological evidence that there were, you know, um, um, settle, settlements that were abandoned in the mid-Holocene at Altithermal, exactly. and they went moved to the foothills mm -hmm. as, as it got very dry uh, during some of those droughts or those, uh, you know, those historical or prehistorical droughts um, right. that we had. Yeah, I do think we can learn um, a lot from the um, Native Americans. Um, mm -hmm regardless of, of what uh, part of the country we're looking at, because um, as a lot of us have come in, um, we're very much a bulldozing through and using up what resources as, as we see necessary. And um, culturally speaking, a, a lot of those groups seem to be, um, you know, you have a relationship with the land and, and what you take, you give back. Um, and there was a respect there that I think uh, we could all learn lessons from uh, that would that would definitely improve how we uh, adapt to and, and mitigate uh, climate change in general. Mm -hmm. uh, well, I think, well, I okay. think that that I think that that relationship is true. That connection with the land. I also think that there's been a shift in thinking from today, even back to you know the 1930s. Um, and what Alan was saying is that we always had more land to go to, right? The West was considered an ex expansive piece of land, right? You can just always move on. You can, you can degrade the soil and just go to the next spot. And I think that's where over the last decades, we've really been able to make that jump, that shift in our thinking to realize that we don't have any more good arable land that we can move to and that we got to protect. And we also have to plan accordingly when we are building, you know, urban areas and thinking about where to build. We build on marginal lands. We don't build on arable lands and just having a little bit more of a mindful way of, of building the infrastructures for our living spaces too. Okay. Just to piggyback yeah. off that, if I could. Sure. One of the things that I, this isn't necessarily my contribution, but the way that I look at some of the conservation policies of the 1930s is as an anti-homestead kind of movement. To your point, the public domain is being used up. There, there is an alternative space for us to move into. Um, and a lot of the management techniques that come out of that period because of the Dust Bowl are in response to that. And so I, I do think that there is uh, kind of a reconciliation here that, that we can't just pick up and, and try somewhere else. And I think that's one of the more powerful long-term impacts of, of the 1930s and the Dust Bowl specifically. Right. Doug, I, I, I'll just follow up on that. You know, you, you suggested in your, and I will read your book. I just have not read it yet, but I will. <laughs> um, um, you suggested that there were lessons learned from the 30s that were applied in the 50s. And can you maybe share a little bit of that me? And then I have one more follow-up after you say that. Okay. Yeah, yeah, thank you for that, because I think it's an important recognition. Um, one of the most important pieces of the 1930s in terms of the response and, and how the 1950s went more smoothly, frankly, is because of this relationship between subsidized conservation and individual farmers. Um, as much as the science might speak to the value of crop rotation or um, lying acreage to fallow or, or you know, strip cropping, a lot of these folks realized that the only way that they could do that reasonably is, is with some kind of government financial assistance. And so by the 1950s, a lot of those structures were in place to subsidize conservation. Um, and in my opinion, at least, that kind of incentive allowed a lot of people to buy into a program that they were at least initially reticent to buy into. Um, and I think the adoption of those techniques and, and really the recognition that they might help long term really started to sink in by the 1950s when a lot of farmers didn't trust the government to do the right thing in the 1930s. Right. And, and by greasing the skids a little bit, by you know, making it more financially viable to practice conservation, uh, to leave acreage to fallow, this, this became a, a really important, um, at least entree to, to conservation techniques used more broadly. Mm -hmm. Okay, here's a follow up, but th this is sort of related and, and there was actually, I'll, I'll address it on the two questions that are coming up. So there are two questions related to something called regenerative agriculture. Okay, they're both related to this. So it says, how important do you see the processes of regenerative agriculture and how they might be protecting soils and sustaining crop yields? And the second question about that is, can, it, does it seem like an approach that's, that's promising? So my question to you, Doug, as somebody who has 
learned from the 20s or the 30s, excuse me, the 50s. And now we're moving into a, you know the new millennia. And the U.S. has the lowest adoption rate of conservation practices across the country in terms of that. And so now we're coming up with new agricultural practices. What's stopping us from implementing the new practices? What, what's going on? Is it, is it monetary? Is it political to government overreach? What, what do you think is going on? I, I think it's probably a combination of those two. Um, I think, frankly, there's always been um, a, at least some animosity. There's resistance. I, I think there's a, a lot of suspicion uh, among uh, farmers when the federal government gets involved. Uh, and I think it's a complicated relationship. Mm -hmm. um, I do think that for a lot of rural people to look at the, the strong hand of the government and, and pushing an agenda is a complicated one for them to recognize. Um, but to your point also, can you, can you make this more financially incentivized? I, I mean, how much is too much money to, to provide for individuals? Uh, that's a hard question to answer, but I also keep coming back to the idea that maybe they shouldn't be farming in these places in the first place. Um, maybe we should think about providing different kinds of training, yeah. job opportunities. Mm -hmm. um, we can find a way where we can produce what we need um, reasonably and with a conservation focus uh, instead of kind of, as we always have in this country, really romanticizing the idea of family farms and agriculture. And I think that's right. a that's a dangerous trope to assume that that, that all farms with some kind of conservation bent are really active conservationists. And so I, I think it's in part cultural. I think it's political. I also think very plainly it's economic. Yeah. And, and we need to recognize the, the role that self-interest plays in this. And it's, right. it's hard to curry favor among folks without some kind of incentive. And mm -hmm. I don't know how you would put a dollar uh, a number on that. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't know if that's really the most appropriate way to go about it. But pragmatically, it, it seemed to work in the 1930s when you, you could sweeten the deal with some money when people needed it. Right. Um, and so I, without really having a projection of how this can happen, it's obvious that we need to address it. Right. Yeah, I mean, and, and the, and the follow-up question, and maybe Sue Ellen can address this, there, there is a, this idea of regenerative agriculture. There's a, there's a quote-unquote shift in the mindset of the agricultural community or the population in general, that smaller scale farms, you know, that whole thing. And you're saying economically, it might not even pay, you know, what's the point? So Sue Ellen, any comments on regenerative ag in terms of uh, the ability to protect soils and, and sustaining yields? Um, I would just wanna, I guess I just wanna say that um, regenerative agriculture is all about improving the land, right? And And part of improving the land is also to make it financially feasible for the farmer. And by and large, the farmer or the rancher wants to do what's best for their land, right? They're not intentionally going out and ruining the, you know, ruining the prospects for the generations to come. Um, they really want to do better. So I think that a, a, a big barrier really is the economic piece. Um, because it takes time, right? To see those changes that you're trying to put in place with the conservation practices and with regenerative agriculture to better better utilize grazing management um, to make sure that you have um, less soil and nutrient loss through erosion to improve retention of water in your soils. That all takes time, um, it's, especially if you have to reverse what you've done, right? Um, and so, yeah, I think I think that many people um, are seeing and are realizing with the stories that come out with the education that that goes out and with the relationships with the research extension and those practicing um, I think people do acknowledge that these practices are good it's just a matter of the time that it takes to see the results and the financial um, barriers in, in shifting your operation uh, here's a, uh, a question. Um, aren't we thinking too locally? What is happening is global, and I don't think we can prepare for a catastrophe that is coming. I don't think how, but I think we need to stop global warming, and there's no way other way to prepare other than stopping global warming. So does anybody want to comment on that? So is this a distraction from the, the real issue? 
right? I think, um, you know, in the case of soil um, and, and dust, if you will, um, you, you know, it can't, it can either accelerate or slow down climate change. And um, we can't really tackle the climate crisis. We can't produce enough food and adapt to a changing climate without looking at, you know, all aspects of the system. And this is just one aspect. The soil is one way in which we can contribute to the climate problem. And um, like Becky was saying before, you know, most of our water is dedicated to, to, to agriculture, 80% of our, our agriculture. So we have to find the leverage points in the system. Where can we make the most change um, with our actions? And ag agriculture is one of those leverage points we can utilize because those are managed systems. We can change our management. Um, and, but that's just the piece of the puzzle. And then we cross our fingers and hope for the best. Okay, another question we're, we're gonna start screaming through these. How does the co co uh, Colorado population expansion to the east onto the prairies affecting land, manage, land and water management? And how could this potentially impact the environment? So looking at urbanization or, or development uh, on top of this whole thing. A different land use. I mean, real estate, especially in Colorado, is is just a, at a premium. So I imagine that for many um, of the people who own uh, acreage on the eastern plains, um, but still in the view of the mountains, probably, um, you know, it, it would be very tempting to to sell that mm -hmm. and. Um, and it's likely that that is what's happened if you go out on I-70, I mean, deer trail. Um, there are neighborhoods, huge neighborhoods now in deer trail, which, which um, just, yeah, I, I was flabbergasted when I saw that. I was like, what is happening? Um, and it's inevitable. Um, and I think there are probably positives and negatives, um, you know, one, I mean, you, you do have an area now that, that's, not, um, that's not going to be seeing those uh, types of changes um, or, or be as susceptible to uh, the impacts of drought um, that when it was farmland would be. Um, what you put there, um, you know, could be positive or negative and, and could positively or negatively impact um, our water resources, you know, I mean, planting of, of more trees, if you're planting native trees, you know, it might, it might be okay, but, you know, we're, we're going around and we're putting trees that don't belong and grass that doesn't belong and, um, you know, how, the, what the long-term effects of that will be, um, I'm not really sure because, you know, that's what we've done in, in our front range cities, so um, I think it's inevitable and I don't know if we actually know what the full effect is going to be, but I, I, I would think that there are positives and ne negatives. Yeah, and, I, and I think a sort of related question is this idea of diverting water from agriculture to urban, right? I mean, th there's clearly going to be something that, you know, that would happen to, um, to our resources. Here's a, um, I think, oh, it's actually, it looks like a comment, so I'll just go ahead and read this and then you, you can all respond to it. One needs to remember that there were no culture, there was it's moving around me. There were no cult, there was no cultivated agriculture, and, and there had been times when the land was highly susceptible to wind erosion. I think it was 2006. High winds caused power lines to arc, start grass fires in southwestern Kansas and parts of Oklahoma. Yet the fire was on ungrazed CRP land swept across the pastures. The CRP land might have been considered a somewhat ideal situation uh, to control the wind erosion since it was ungrazed, but and not mowed. But the fire removed all the vegetation and there was wind erosion. Some winds that started the fire caused extensive wind erosion and all, whether it was grazed or not. So I, I guess the question is, you know, they're, they're, it's any kind of a disturbance, right? On top of the drought that could create, you know, problems for, for um, erosion um, across those systems. Um, let me get a couple more here and then we'll do a wrap up. Uh, due to globalization of our food systems, would another dust bowl type of event cripple economic systems? 
So do we have the do we have the capacity to absorb another dust bowl? Anybody? I, I, well, I just think that's a fascinating question because as I was listening to, to Doug talk and appreciating what he said about learning lessons and changing things from the 30s to the 50s, it's really been a long time since we've had you know a, 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 a multi-year drought where the Dust Bowl footprint was. And we, we can think that we now, with whether it's with regenerative agriculture or with these new techniques to try and keep the soil covered, we won't really know until we have another 10 year period or eight year period, whether yeah. that's gonna be sufficient or not, or whether the system is just gonna to be too fragile to handle right. that kind of disturbance to it. Um, right. You know, you, there's only so much you can learn from the past, right? And, and, yeah. and with global warming overall, with warming air temperatures, aridity in general is just increased because there's greater evaporation from all surfaces, whether it's plants or the soil. Um, and, and so I, I think it's a really, scary proposition to think about if we if we just repeated the the, the weather conditions of those 10 years in the next 10 years i mean think, think about 2012 right we just had a one-year drought and, and it was in the millions of dollars of loss of, of agricultural productivity in one year across the great plains it, it, i don't know how we'd handle 10 years today i don't know if we do that much better than we did in the past this, yeah again that might be a question for doug yeah well it's, it's interesting i mean the fact that we saw how vulnerable our food systems were to a pandemic of this pandemic, only a year, and and how that sort of shifted everything, and then you know, so maybe maybe the question of, to run by everybody, you know, as we're closing out in, in about another five or six minutes, is um, you know this idea that what do we really need to know in order to prepare? So maybe I'll start with you, Alan. Like you know, you study the effects of drought on grasses, and you induce drought on grasses and in grasslands. So what what are the things we don't know yet? Like what is missing for us to be able to sort of predict directional changes or resiliency what is not yeah. what don't we have yeah so what, what we don't what we don't have is is we, we do a lot of experiments right we're scientists we study these systems and and we tend to study them on a short time scale almost universally we have what's called the long-term ecological research programs but when it comes to doing things like imposing experimental droughts right for us a long-term drought in, in the field might be four years Right. Well, and we can learn a lot from those four year periods. But but again, what if it's a 10 year drought? What if it's a 15 year drought? One thing we've learned is that over time, problems tend to exacerbate that, that we and it's very hard to predict. It's, it's usually not a linear phenomenon where you can just count on five years being a little bit worse than four years, a little bit worse than three years. Oftentimes there are thresholds that are crossed. There are major changes that take number of years to, to happen, but when they do happen, they're for the most part unpredictable and surprises. And so for us, what we oftentimes think about is, is temporal scale and spatial scale. You know, how, how can we understand how these natural systems are likely to respond to a, 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 a drought of the proportions of the, of the Dust Bowl drought going from, well, you look at the picture behind me, that's dust in Washington, DC, right? right? So going from a, a drought of that spatial scale and then add on top of that a drought of the temporal scales, which, which are likely to be longer than they were in the 30s. And, and that's going to require a, a lot of dedication and foresight to set up those studies to try and understand the system before it happens to us naturally. Right. Becky, what about you from a climatological perspective? What, what are the unknowns and what do, you, what do we need to, what are the new discoveries we need in order to sort of assess, you know, have, what have we learned from the past? And like, what, how are we going to prepare for this? What, what would you say then? critical knowledge gaps? You know, what we need is improvements in um, prediction, particularly that, that most critical stage that, that many stakeholders are relying on is the um, seasonal time scale. Mm -hmm. um, what's gonna be happening in the next season, in the next year, that um, is, is really almost impossible to answer right now. We don't know when we're going into the next drought. We don't know where that drought is going to be. We don't even know when we're in it, um, you know, how long it's going to take to, to recover from that. Um, <clears throat> and so I think these are, are big challenges um, in the field of, of climate and weather is um, really to help take um, agricultural community to not just be in a um, response and relief 
um, attitude, but, but a little bit more proactive. Um, you know, we've, we've got our general best practices and in, in management um, techniques, but to be able to say it is very likely that in the next six months, uh, you will be entering a severe drought and um, this is how you can prepare for it, um, I think is, is one of the things that, that are very important for us to work on is, is improving that, that prediction and early warning of drought. Okay, so Ellen, from sort of the, the perspective of soils and agriculture, what would you say in terms of, you know, our, again, the lessons learned from the past and, and moving ahead, do we have the necessary knowledge to, to prepare for a prolonged drought in the breadbasket yeah. of the world? Yeah. I think we do have the necessary knowledge. I mean, I think that we need to do a better job of, um, in terms of our needs, evaluating our natural resources, um, mapping them, mapping the system and knowing the limits of the defined system. So that spatial and temporal scale that Alan was referring to. We also need to evaluate the people's needs. What are the markets? What do people want? Um, what do they need? And we also, in terms of agriculture, we need to fit the cropping system to those natural resources and to the needs of those people's. Uh, to these people, which includes the profit, profitability of the farmer for the farmer. And we need to take the long-term view, right? The long view. And so I think a big piece of what we need is to see these systems as such, as systems, and to also try to solve the problem. So both perceiving the problem and acting on solving the problem mm -hmm. um, so that we can most efficiently conduct, you know, an understanding of um, or act on, on what we need. And, and with this characterization of, of systems, right, characterizing the systems with these evaluations, we can better make the interpretations on the general human vulnerability to environmental change. And that's not something that we directly talked about today, but the human vulnerability to environmental change and the multi-scale determinants of vulnerability is really what <clears throat> is really what needs to be addressed. Mm -hmm. and, and then Doug, I guess I'll, I'll sort of go to you to sort of, you know, help us sort of wrap this up. So, so now you've, you have, you have extensive knowledge from your research of the thirties, the dirty thirties and the filthy fifties. And now you're in modern history is happening right now. And we're looking at a drought coming or it's here and it's we're, we're, so what, what do we need to do? Um, sociologically, or what, what are we missing? What, what's, the, what's the key point here? And what, what's, what are the knowledge gaps that you have in your discipline in terms of, you know, how, do, how are we gonna, how are we gonna, how are we gonna address this? Yeah, um, yeah you, you've identified how uncomfortable I am talking about the present in the future. <laughs> um, it, it's, it's certainly not, not something I'm used to, but I, I will just suggest this. One of the things that I think was vital in terms of the reaction to the 1930s and the ways in which the 1950s went more smoothly is something that I think all of you guys are addressing, which is we can think about these problems, we can develop potential solutions to these problems, but there has to be communication. Um, there, there has to be a combination of factors in play where the, the individuals on the ground who are farming can, can speak to the experts, you can build that relationship, that knowledge can be shared, um, and, and really it can be a cooperative effort. One of the things I looked at in the 1930s was, was really the, the embrace of the Colorado uh, Cooperative Extension Service mm -hmm. and, and the ways in which county agents were able to build these relationships with individuals uh, in farming communities and, and, and by ingratiating themselves in these communities, kind of the, the, the more progressive and more advanced scientific knowledge that they were able to convey went down more smoothly once you have that relationship built. And so frankly, it's fantastic. You guys are doing incredible work. I've, I've really valued my time here on this panel with you. But I, I think that we need to take that knowledge from a place like CSU and apply it. We need to be able to put these into the communities themselves. We need to have these individual relationships and we need to really kind of rely on that cooperative mentality that we're all in this together. Um, and, and I don't know exactly how that can be developed in a smooth and, and efficient way. Uh, but I will tell you that that's one of the things that certainly stuck out to me in thinking about the past was that relationship and, and the ways in which it developed over time and, and how it, it was never easy necessarily. And it wouldn't be easy now, I'm sure. 
but it's it's a necessary consequence, I think, of, of preparation is to make sure that we're all on the same page, mm -hmm. that these ideas are being shared and, and that we can we can approach this uh, in a more unified way. Great. Well, thank you. OK, gang, I'm sorry to say that we're up to time. And so um, you guys have done an outstanding job. So. Um, we have close to 70 participants, so let's give them a virtual clap or a hand for the audience. Okay, very well done, all of you. Um, I'd like to thank and acknowledge our director, Diana Wall, for pulling this all together. I want to thank uh, Laura and the staff for letting us do this. And, you know, I formally, when I usually end these things at Avogadro, is I usually want to tell everybody you should try to ride your bikes home. So just go out and get some exercise tonight or something. Maybe they'll do something like that to save the planet. But uh, thanks for participating, everybody. And um, uh, everybody be safe and we'll see you in a month with the next uh, with the next series of uh, panelists. OK, bye. Thank you. Bye bye, guys.